Hi, Homeworthy. I'm Susie. Welcome to my church home. Come on in. You're watching Homeworthy, where we believe every home has a story. Like and subscribe for more. Hi, I'm Susie Batiz. I am the Chief Executive and Visionary Officer for Poopery Supernatural and my personal development course, Alive OS. Right now, we're in Dallas, Texas, and we're in my home. It's my church home. I live in an old church. I live in a 120-year-old St. John's Methodist Church. So I ended up living in a church. My daughter was dating someone that had grown up in a little, small, white church in upstate New York. And I started looking for churches online. I really thought I was gonna buy a little tiny white church out in the country that I would have as a second home, or you know, like a, a little weekend home. And I saw this particular church online. It was way above my budget at the time, so I let that dream you know, go away. A few years later, I was getting my hair done and there was so much synchronicity. My hairdresser at the time said, um, I'm gonna go help someone move and they happen to be living in a church they're trying to sell. And I go, that's so weird, I wanted to buy a church. And she showed me this was the same church I had seen three years before. And the minute I walked in, you know, I can say I heard angels singing. You know, it was this 100% resonant yes in my body. It was not in great shape. And my realtor at the time told me she didn't even wanna write the contract. She said, this is a bad investment. It's in a not great neighborhood. You're a single woman. I don't want to, I don't want you to buy this church. And I said, I'm buying the church. Either you sign the contract, you know, give me the contract or I'm gonna go with another realtor. Um, so it's really funny that even though I had this internal impulse, regardless of what outside people were telling me, there was just something I felt in my bones that this was not only my home, but it was also a place for me to have community and gatherings and that it's more of a work live space than just me living here. It didn't look great when I first bought it. Um, I could see one of my blessings, I think one of my gifts and also one of my curses is that I can see potential. Um, I think I've dated too many people on potential. <laughs> but sometimes that potential actually works out. In this case, it did. You know, there were, for example, every time it rained, we would have to get buckets and big plastic tarps and funnel all the water because this place was like a colander. There was water everywhere. These stained glass windows that you see were just riddled with holes that looked like a machine gun had you know, um, done, it was actually hail damage from a couple storms that the previous owner never fixed. There were holes in the floor, just so much was in what people see disarray, but I didn't see any of that. All I saw was this incredible structure. I felt the energy of it. So I looked beyond all of that because really those are just cosmetic things, you know, that can be fixed. It did take several years. A lot of people ask me um, when touring the home, like how long did it take you to remodel the home? And I often say, you should ask the church how long it took to remodel me because I was being transformed inside. I had just gone through a divorce, I was going through a divorce. Um, I was, you know, my children were grown. I was facing empty nests. So I was at a place in my life where I was being transformed internally at the same time as I was transforming this home. So I look at, we had this symbiotic relationship going on. You know, it was a very special time in my life. I get a little teary um, always remembering that time. Welcome to the entry of my home. This is pretty much the way it was. The walls are all original, the stained glass is original. I did find these chairs right here in the attic, which I loved, so they haven't ever been refinished or anything, so I kept them. I often say that um, they didn't leave me a lot in the home whenever I bought it. They had taken a lot out, but I used whatever I have. Someone had told me that should be the title of my book, is I took what I had left and built this, right? I did leave, these were on the walls. It's some memories of some of the past people that were in the congregation, which I thought that I felt was very sweet. 
even though some spiritual worker came in and told me that was negative energy in the home. I'm like, well, I don't see it as negative energy. I see it very positive that people were very grateful of people that contributed to the space. And there are actually two entrances to the church, but this is what I use as my main entry. And now I'll take you into the sanctuary slash living room. So this is my living room that was formerly the sanctuary of the church. The ceilings are, I think, at the peak around 33 feet tall. Um, the amazing thing is while the space feels really large, once you're in it, it actually can feel very warm at the same time, which I take great pride in that. And these are original stained glass windows, mostly original. I did have them repaired because of damage, as I said earlier, um, and that this, repair took about two years because it's done very meticulously by hand. Everyone I had working on the exterior of the church were historic um, approved tradesmen or craftsmen that were able, or craftswomen actually, um, did a lot of the stained glass. So um, I went to great extents to try to replace the stained glass to as close to original as I could, even though they didn't make exactly this type of stained glass any longer. The walls are all original, brick walls. I did whitewash them. And all of the wood that you see, these floors, are 120-year-old soft pine. They dent very easily. There's still little heel marks in them, which I left. I did have them refurnished, uh, refurbished. But you know what's amazing about the floors is they're not hardwoods. The church didn't have the money to purchase hardwoods. And I didn't have the heart to cover up the soft pine. So I just had them um, refinished and live with the beautiful soft pine that they also lived with. It was funny, when I first moved into the church, I kept telling my assistant I wanted a swing in the living room. And it took her about two years. And finally I said, hey, what is happening with the swing that I want in the living room? She's like, you're serious? And I was like, yes. I mean, I have this great ceiling. I have this amazing space. Why don't we have a swing? So I worked with some local um, metalsmiths uh, that came in and they actually built this swing and it had uh, structural engineers come in. It can hold up to 2,000 pounds, even though we didn't quite need that, but there have been you know, lots of kids rumbling on it and things. Um, and I spent a lot of hours on this during my divorce, just swinging back and forth. <laughs> so it's normally a focal point when people come in, they immediately want to take a picture on the swing, get on the swing. And my great niece, uh, she was 10 from Arkansas when she came in and saw it. She said, Aunt Susie, everyone needs a swing in their living room. <laughs> And I just love that. I said, they do, they do. So, and I have had some friends that have put swings in even like a 10 foot ceiling. You know, it's nice just to be lifted off of the ground sometimes. So the way this all began with Poopery is 17 years ago, I was at a dinner party in a small house with one bathroom. And it was a family gathering and we were talking about bathroom odor. And we wondered how it could be stopped. And one of my family members said, I wonder if you can trap bathroom odor. And immediately I had this vision that oil floats on water. I was a closet hippie that always played with essential oils. So I was like, I can do that. It took me nine months of mixing and investigating and studying different oils. But nine months later, I created Poopery. I harassed all of my friends and family the entire time, you know, asking them, do you gotta go to the bathroom? You know, cause I needed test subjects. And um, one day my husband at the time walked out of the bathroom and he was holding the bottle and he says, we're gonna be millionaires. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, do you realize what you've done? You've taken the smell out of poop. And of course that was the beginning of where I knew because of my failed entrepreneur attempts in the past, I didn't really wanna be in business, but the product was so good I knew it had to come to market. I've sold over 150 million bottles. So while I knew this was game changing and something that the world needed, especially women, you know, I um, did not expect it to ever be this large. And every day I'm grateful. And it just keeps growing larger and larger and larger beyond my wildest expectations. So this is what I um, live in as my living room, living space. I built a nice little center here where you can just kind of commune. The fireplace was put in um, 
by a previous owner that had started remodeling the church a little bit before I bought it. It has to be a gas fireplace because, you know, you don't want to take a flue all the way up, a chimney all the way up, um, even though I love real wood much better. And then you, if you face here, this is the kitchen. And the kitchen is the old altar um, to the church. This is all original. This is original to the church. Um, the balcony's original, the little stairway's original, um, but I actually went in and put a kitchen in this area. First time when I bought this church, I was so overwhelmed, the first shipment of furniture that I got in, because I really had spent a lot of money to me at the time, and the furniture arrived, and it fit this little tiny spot right here in the middle of the <laughs> sanctuary, and I cried actually for two days. And I thought, oh my God, how am I ever, ever, ever going to furnish this space? Um, and then once I came to, what I realized is that it, doesn't, it didn't have to be furnished all in one moment, that this could be a gradual process, room by room. And that's the way I took it. You know, it's 15,000 square feet. So just to think, bam, here's all the furnishing is pretty impossible for anyone. So I would just take it room by room and start purchasing as I could. And um, because, you know, I had several designers that I interviewed whenever I was um, with the church. I decided not going with a professional um, interior designer because they would say words like, this would look good in here. And this would look good. And I said, I don't want anything that looks good. I want something that feels good, that I love, right? So I ended up working with an, um, someone, a graphic designer um, that worked at my company. And she had a great, she had great taste, she did events. And I said, hey, would you help me you know, with some furniture? So we furnished it together. So every single thing in the house, down to my forks that I have had hand metal etched with words in them, I've chosen and I've picked out, down to the spatulas. So every single thing I love. And, you know, being a, a wife and a mother for most of my life prior to this, everything was about the children and my family. And this was the first time that I got to say, like, this is mine and I get to choose exactly what I want. <laughs> this is a living space. And one of my favorite things about this space is, I love the rug. This was the first big purchase that I made um, ever in my adult life. And um, it's silk and it was very expensive. And it was something that literally was a moment of me having to feel worthy inside of number one, it felt very um, wasteful for me to spend so much on something, right, that I loved. So I had a whole inner process of going in and going like, not only do I deserve it, I can afford it, and I should have nice things um, in my home. So I, this rug will be in my life for the rest of my life because it was that moment of transition for me and, and feeling really deserving and worthy. And another thing is, I love these um, tables. They're actually old English um, wash tubs um, that were turned upside down and etched out and cut. Um, they're very heavy, <laughs> but I love them. I also am not meticulous. I love lived in spaces. So you'll not find anything in this house that is too precious to put a cup down on or, you know, to actually live in. I can't stand when you go in those places and you feel like you can't set anything down or, you, you know, like you're going to hurt something. So I, on purpose, wanted this to feel very lived in and that you could be welcome here and, and feel at home. So the piece of art over fireplace is a piece I had commissioned by an artist out of Kauai. Um, I just loved her artwork. It was very bright and felt lively. Again, this whole thing you're going to find out is this is about a new period in my life, you know, where I'm having a, a kind of a second life in my midlife. Um, and I just loved her work. It was very bright and colorful, and it felt like where I was um, within my own process of my own journey as a woman. So the home right now has, I believe, 10 bedrooms. Um, it has 13 and a half baths. Um, it's a lot. Um, 
you know, <laughs> I often <laughs> wonder about that. You know, it's like, wow, I don't really particularly need that many. And what is nice is you'll see, I've turned lots of them into multi-use spaces. For example, one of the old bedrooms I have as a closet, another one I've turned into a sauna room, another one I have a paint room. Um, one of them I have a, as a little small office for an assistant or for someone that's here. So I've also repurposed some of the bedrooms and some of the rooms that were here whenever I bought it. And it's nice if I want to have an event, which I'm going to have an event, um, a live OS here in May, and I can also house a lot of people. So when they all have kind of private bathrooms, so that's nice as well. Knowing that it's not just a space for me to live in, it's a live workspace, um, it has come in handy. Yeah, one thing I would like to note about this space is the lights above. These were supposedly the first pendant lights in Dallas. Um, they're really amazing. I, I put them on winches so that they could be lowered and raised so that we could clean them. Um, but they're really incredible. Whenever I bought them, whenever I bought the church, they were much lower because they were for a church and I raised them up. Over here's the dining area. Um, again, as you knew that this isn't just a private space for me, it was a space for me to have multiple people in and gatherings. So I have a table that seats 14 people. Um, I wanted it to feel still homey yet um, have a place that's grand enough to entertain a lot. Um, what's interesting, the chairs, like these chairs um, are a couple hundred years old and they were out of an old castle in France. So I just found all of these old pieces and these are actually just um, more of a modern chair, believe it or not. And I had one of my friends, it's an amazing faux finisher, match them. So each one of them have silk cushions. Again, it's all about comfort. These were some interior doors that were in the, they were on the inside of the entry. And um, I didn't know what to do with them because I didn't need them. So I ended up having them cut out and put here and made into a big china cabinet. As I said, they didn't leave me a lot, but what they left me, I used completely. And um, I wish they would have left me more. And now we're going to the kitchen, which used to be the altar of the church. It's a really grand space. I love the idea of my food being cooked in what used to be an altar, right? It feels very sacred. Um, again, I love home, I love family, I love sharing, I love cooking. So having a space that's big enough that people can sit around while I'm over here cooking a meal um, feels very resonant with me in my life. And um, I just chose it to be really white and bright. I felt like that brought the energy of the church. You know, we think of churches as these holy places. One thing I will tell you um, design-wise that I love about this space, um, I love the elevation, I love that it's a special space, but also this piece that I had etched out of metal. This was a poem that my daughter called me one day and she said, Mom, if you were a poem, this is you. I asked her to write the poem out and I actually gave it to my graphic designer and she designed this and we had it etched out of metal and backlit. So you'll find throughout the house, I have lots of pieces and things that aren't particularly beautiful to other people, but that are really special and precious to me. Yeah, so you'll see in the house, I have lots of trees and flowers and plants. And even, you know, if anybody, you can Google my story online and hear a lot about it. There were, most of my life, I didn't have very much money, but fresh flowers were never an option. If I had to go pick them on the side of the road, they always made me happy. So anytime you come into my home, you'll always see fresh flowers. Also, you'll never see any fake plants. Everything is real. <laughs> this tree, actually, her name is Dolly, because one of my friends, when I brought her in, it took 10 guys to bring her in. It's so massive. And uh, one of my friends said, wow, she's really top heavy. And I said, yeah, let's name her Dolly. So that's why her name is Dolly. Um, but yeah, I have fresh plants everywhere. They all have names. I do believe that they bring a living, vibrant energy into the space, whatever your space is in. It's funny, I was in Hawaii and I was staying in this rental home 
and the guy had fake plants in there. And I was like, oh my God, this just feels so dead. You know, so if you're listening and you have artificial plants, I suggest that you maybe trade those out. Yes, it does take a little more care, but also they give a lot of oxygen and energy to your space as well. And now we'll head upstairs to the, um, what used to be the choir loft and the choir room that's now my meditation room. Yeah, so the space up here, this was an old choir loft. Um, it was actually had all the levels when I, I bought it. I ended up taking it up, repurposing the wood and flattening it out. I used to have it as a living space. Now I just use it as space where we can do different um, sound healing or breath work. Everyone brings a yoga mat. I use it as a larger yoga space when I have other people here. So again, it's just an extra space that I have in the house. And then we'll go over to my meditation room. I've been a meditator for 20 years and I often like to find a space that I consider sacred that not a lot of people are in. It doesn't have a lot of activity or a lot of disruption. And that's this space. It used to be the old um, choir loft where they hung the robes. You can see on the walls right over here where the um, like, you know, little choir robes used to hang. So many people, so many contractors came into this space um, when I first bought the house and everyone wanted to fix the walls. And I'm like, you're not gonna touch the walls. I love that they have all the original aged finish. Um, so I left it exactly as it is. And I put a really interesting, which I love, it's a little bit of an iridescent film, so that no matter what time during the day you're here, you see a different color reflected. It goes from pink, green, blue, yellow, all different colors. It's a really inexpensive film um, that I really suggest if you want to liven up a space and give it a little extra energy. So this, my assistants actually got it for me for Christmas. It's a copper meditation triangle. I don't know if you're supposed to ascend to the heavens or what, but um, I do actually sit in it and it brings a lot of energy. Um, this piece right here is an amazing old piece. It is from the 17th century. Um, and it was a gift that was given to me by my ex-husband um, because he knew that I wanted something special in this room. Um, and it's an old, um, it's an old Tibetan piece um, from a gallery owner here in Dallas. And another fun thing about this room is I have, this is, I don't know what the official name is, but in Catholic churches, when they swing the kapal, you know, that, the, the incense that you smell, it's actually kapal, and this is a kapal burner. And um, I just thought it was too cool. I was like, okay, I've got to get one of those for this. I've turned it into a flower pot. I have, I have a little bit of church memorabilia in here. You can't get too much because then it starts looking more costumey um, than authentic. Um, but every once in a while, you'll see a little wink back to the um, old religious, you know, roots of the church. Yeah, so you'll notice in the church that I left some of the windows regular glass because I didn't realize until I got into the space that you can't see the outside world. Think about when you're in church. You know, it's a totally enclosed space. And I love to see the sky and I love to see the trees outdoors and life happening outside. So I left some of the windows, I have the stained glass stored upstairs so that it can still be put back, but I did very selectively uh, choose to leave some of the windows just glass, if you'll look up here, just so that I can still see the sky outside. One really fun thing about the church is that it was a working church, so there were so many different rooms. For example, we're not gonna go in there, but my bedroom is the old marriage counseling office. Um, and this room was actually the only room with no natural sunlight, and it was the church nursery. So knowing that it had no natural sunlight and what could I do in the space, I turned it into a sauna room. I turned it into almost like a nursery, right? Where you could come back and rest and rejuvenate through the day. And um, when you shut the doors, and turn all the lights out. I purposefully painted the walls this dark eggplant so that it really was truly a dark space. Um, I have a massage table in here. 
Um, whenever people come to give me a massage, I have a sauna, I have a biomat, I have different sound healing tools in the room, but it truly is just a space for rejuvenation. I think one of the main things that I love telling entrepreneurs, there's a lot of myths out there. One of the myths is that everyone's out to get you and no one wants to help you. That's absolutely not my experience. My experience is people are rooting for you. They wanna be a part of your success and they wanna help you. So I think if you can understand that, um, my daughter's a young filmmaker and I just shared this with her. You know, she's like, how am I gonna get this done? I need this. And I said, just call people, people wanna help you. And she called me later after her first film and she's like, oh my God, mom, everybody wants to help. So I think that people don't think about that. You know, there's all these stories out there. Another thing is you don't necessarily have to always have your own force that's going, there is something natural and innate. For example, when you have a child, there's something inside of you that keeps you getting up in the middle of the night to take care of them, to make sure they're fed. It's the same thing with your company. When you create something that's born of your heart and your passion, there's a natural impulse to want to take care of it and to make sure it survives in the world. You know, so you will have these. If you have to push through too hard and override any natural um, tendencies within you and you think you can't make it, then you might want to reconsider if this is what you should be doing. Yes, there's going to be hard days, but there should be something coming out of you that you want to love and nurture and take care of this thing that you birthed into the world regardless of um, anything else. This space is what I guess most people call a mudroom. Um, it, you know, blends the inside to going out to the outside patio. Um, one fun thing, I just built um, a unit here to hang coats, to house different blankets for outside. Um, I have a whole outdoor seating area with heaters. I love staying outside most of the year. And um, you're probably going to see that I have a lot of roller skates. And what's really fun is at one point I was dating a musician. And I was married to one too, so that's a thing. But, um, and he said, <clears throat> you have such a big living room. I don't know why you're not roller skating in here. And I thought it was absolutely the best idea I'd ever heard. So I bought a bunch of pair of roller skates one New Year's Eve and I had a roller skating party. And now we roller skate quite a bit in the, in the sanctuary. Um, you can go back and see that it has a literal ring. And someone asked me once like, what if it ruins the floors? I was like, oh my God, imagine if we lived our life worried about the floors being ruined. I was like, I'll get them refinished. You know, am I gonna not roller skate because I don't want my floors ruined? So anyway, I love that. What I love most about my home is that it's a play workspace and live space. You know, it's not one particular thing. I can roller skate in the living room. I can use it for meditating and having serious sound baths and spiritual gatherings. I can have in my home office creative brainstorms that are all professional business. So the space is really multi-use, multi-genre. And then I can have roller skating parties, you know, where my grandson and his little you know, car going around the living room. This is one of the original pieces that was left in the church. I'm assuming it's an outside sign. Um, again, the spiritual person came in and said it was negative energy in the home. I didn't agree with them. I love, um, I love history. And it looks like, you know, the neighborhood that this is in maybe was a little rougher neighborhood and people maybe took a few shots at it. Which again, you know, it's kind of, what I love is it was never broken through. So for me, it's symbolic that we may get shots taken to us, not literal, but in the metaphorical sense, yet we are really strong and very impenetrable. You know, we're very resilient humans. It's a reminder of that. It feels way different from living in a regular home. Um, one time I had an Uber driver pick me up and he said, do you live there? And I said, yeah. And he said, imagine the prayers that have gone up and the blessings that have come down from living in that space. And I asked, actually asked him if he would be my driver. He drove, I didn't like driving to work. It was a long distance and I could work in the car. 
and he ended up being my driver for many years. But that is the truth. You know, you can feel the blessings that went on in the space. You can feel the happiness, the weddings, the births, the, you know, maybe even deaths, all these periods of transition. I happen to call it the temple of transformation because I do believe it's this place. Um, I've had, I think, right now I have the eighth woman living here. Um, that has been in a transition in her life with me. They live in, you know, I give them part and give them up to nine months to live here because sometimes we just need a little bit of a break from life. Um, and it's really, it helped me in transition. It helps other people in transition. And when you think about a religious place and religious ceremonies, there's a lot of transition going on. You know, we're always moving from one place to another. And you can feel all that energy here. And of course, that has come with some um, visitors of the non-physical realm. Um, I won't say the house is haunted, but I'd rather say it's blessed. Um, but I do have three rules in the house. Um, because I had to first claim the space when I got in because there was some ruckus. And I said, number one, you can't ever show yourself to me. Number two, you can't scare me. And the third thing is that you must only be here if you're in the highest good of everyone that enters the space. So I had to really lay down some rules and say, and, and I've had a great time. You know, everyone that's ever been in the house only feels amazing positive energy, so those really worked. Okay, so now we'll go up to my home office. This is a painting my daughter and I did when she was like 12 years old. So I love things and the, keeping things that mean a lot to me. Um, this is my home office. Um, it's about 2,000 square feet, um, which is quite large. Someone once told me when you're in a creative meeting that you should have a view that is really far, right? So that you can get the, the big ideas. I love that you can see the skyline of Dallas here. And one thing that I particularly love about the space is this used to be the Sunday school um, class right and I love the feeling of youth being here and having fun also you'll notice the floors are at different heights right what I learned from the historic um, society is that this used to be a tent church and the back part of the church was built first in 1910 or in 1890 this was started and um, do you remember the old you saw the old balconies and then somebody would be down in the center well that's what this space was that's why these floors are at this level so the windows are you know equal to the floor but i think it gives it a lot of character when i came in um, i raised the roof right here or the ceiling um, because i wanted a little more height again i used things i found in the church these are fans um, that were in the attic and I had it turned into a conference table, um, which is really fun. It all, again, thinking of a creative space, you know, they move, people can play around. I had several pieces of furniture made out of the old fire escape. It did not legally have to have a fire escape, and it did go through my master bedroom, so I didn't feel safe with it, so I had it removed, most of it removed, and I had it re, um, redone into different pieces of furniture. So not only do I have creative um, meetings here, but as I told you earlier, I'm a maker. I make things. Um, and the way I created poopery is I made it, you know? So uh, I make a lot of our own fragrances, a lot of the products. So I sit here and I have many different types of oils and scents that I will just come up here and I'll start playing. These are all notes of different formulas that I, because, you forget, right? <laughs> you think you're gonna remember and then you don't. Um, so I'll just come up here and start playing with different scents whenever I have an idea or if I smell something out in the world, like, oh my God, I wanna make something that kind of smells like that, I'll come in and play. So for me, this is a play space. Um, it's a workplace space. And sometimes I have friends, uh, they'll come over and they feel really nervous, but I'll say, just pick out some scents that you like and then I'll blend them up a little bottle of a, you know, essential oil blend that, that they love. And every time they love it, they're like, oh my God, this is amazing. I'm like, yeah, because it contains everything you loved, right? 
One of the things that really surprised me, and it always surprises me with every project, is everyone always tells you this is going to take longer and cost more than you ever think possible. And you're like, yeah, 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 whatever. It surprised me on how many years the extent of going back and repairing 120 years of things not being done right and correctly and being in integrity and realizing, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to rip all these wires out of this wall, completely redo the electrical, right, and not just patch it the way it had been done. So that was still, so every time it was so shocking, every time they opened a wall or every time we went into a project, every time I was shocked, like, what? Oh my gosh, which I don't know why, because we all know this, when you buy an older home, it's an act of love. Um, and I do believe, uh, I believe that we do need these historic homes. And I believe that it takes, you know, um, you have to have a passion for it. You have to have a passion to want to rebuild it and rebuild it in integrity. This is one of the guest rooms that um, I like to call the Buddha room because it has a couple of Buddhas in it. This is the only room that houses anything from my previous life. Um, so this room is all furnished with things that were mine in my old home and old space. Um, the Buddha, the table, um, this is a piece of art from Peru that I got down there many years ago. And um, it's, it's halfway, it's a half basement. So what's so amazing about the space, the scale, the size of it, it's very comfortable. But then also it's very grounding. So sometimes you know, if I'm feeling ungrounded, I'll come sleep down here, but it's a space that guests love to, to stay in. And I furnished it, I furnished it with different things. You'll see lots of wood. Um, this is, I love this light. It's an old tumbleweed that was turned upside down with a light fixture in it that I thought was super fun. <laughs> Um, this is the basement of the church, and what I love about it, it was the old rec center, you know. I remember going to church, and then afterwards everybody would come down, and you would eat meals usually. That's what this is. You can see even the old, um, what's it called, Sh shuffleboard with the little triangle. Do you see the floor? So it's really fun. So you know that this truly was a rec center of the church. I've repurposed it with things. I built a kitchen down here that's really good for events so that people don't have to be cooking in the main kitchen. If I'm having an event, they can cook down here. Also, if I have guests, because the downstairs is 5,000 square feet, they can stay down here, have their own kitchen where they feel like they're separate from the main space. Um, I, dec I decorated it with, again, this is an old bowling lane, a table made out of an old bowling alley. And then these are original windows to the church that there were 160 windows on the back of the church that I had refurbished by a historic um, window company. And they still have all the original pulleys and everything in them, but they had to be updated. But I had 160, 160 of these windows left. I didn't know what to do. And we came up with the idea to make them into different dividing screens. So when you have a large area, they sort of divide the space. And again, I didn't throw them away or get rid of them. They're still here. They're just in a different form. Also, um, my dream when I was young was to be a fashion designer. Um, I didn't, that wasn't on the Arkansas State University college, <laughs> things you could do or be in the world. Um, so I didn't even really know that that was a career or something you could train for. I sewed my whole life. You'll keep hearing the theme, I'm a maker. Um, I sewed Barbie clothes since the time I was, you know, big enough to hold a needle. Um, I made my own clothes. I got my first job when I was 15 because I wanted to buy clothes. Um, I didn't want to wear all the homemade clothes. Now, of course, all I want to do is make my clothes. It's funny how we <laughs> go full circle back to what we actually wanted to do. So one of my friends was closing down her sewing factory, so I bought a bunch of machines. I've only gotten as far as making scarves for some of my friends and a couple pieces for myself. Um, I forgot how much labor and how much time it takes, but I look forward to spending more time here. Another thing I did down here is I built a podcast room. Even though this was an old closet that I turned into a podcast room, even though I don't have a podcast right now, it has been something I've flirted with for a few years. I do think at some point I will do that, maybe in the very near future, you'll see. Um, 
but I built that space specifically for this. So you can just see there's lots of spaces. This is a workout space um, that I utilize. I just left it open. Some of the little small rooms, you know, the room, because it was a functioning working church, had a lot of office space. That's why it has so many bedrooms, right? They were offices. So this is one of the offices that I've decorated with a couple of twin beds. That way when I have events or um, a lot of guests staying, everyone can have their own private bed. Again, these aren't expensive decorating techniques. This is literally some rope with dried flowers that's gone down the wall. So people think that it is gonna take a lot of money and cost a lot of money, it's not. You know, the rug I bought off of Etsy, it's all about you know, um, having fun and being able to explore, right? I also love most everything in the house is either vintage, handmade, or sustainably made. There is less than 1% of the house that is bought at any mass retailer. So there's lots you can do by just going and repurposing furniture and buying it you know, going to local artists, um, go to your local outdoor markets. You wouldn't believe how much you could do that has a lot of style, character, you know, your help supporting a local artist as well without having to, you know, um, put more stuff in the world. <laughs> One of my friends is a well-known Dallas artist, and one time when I was going through my divorce, I said, I just need to throw some paint. So I went into his space, and what I noticed is he had a floor and walls that it didn't matter that paint got all over it. So I took, again, one of these old offices, and I put down this felt flooring over the concrete. You'll see that I've painted many things here. I have friends over, we do paint. This is a room that's not gonna get damaged by by throwing paint. So I have it set up here because I had the space and um, I just come down here and this is one of the latest pieces I did, which I love. I just threw a bunch of really heavy, thick paint on it and just kept moving it. I actually would love a scarf made out of it. <laughs> but again, you see the theme of the house is play, work, live, you know, um, it's not so serious. So I love having a space. I even have some plates down here that um, people can break. So if I have, um, I have someone right now or someone close to me that's going through a divorce and I'm like, let's get some goggles and some hammers and let you break some plates. You know, it's like sometimes we need some of these somatic releases in life that we rarely get. Too much keeping it all together. Sometimes we just gotta let it loose. The word home to me is like a sacred space. I think of a womb, you know, it's this place where you can come back and recharge and rest and regroup before you go out into the world. Um, I'm a cancer in astrology, you know, that's, um, you know, the crab that likes her shell. So home to me is very important. It always has been. Um, I love home because it's a place where not only am I rested, but where I can also bring friends and family in and give them a little refuge from life as well. Thanks for watching. For more homeworthy content, be sure to like and subscribe.